Welcome and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm your host, Daniel Davis. It's amazing that we have a show that people consider it's for people in midlife, baby boomers, if you will. Well, then we kind of dig out that past that we must all live together to find out how we have some common things that kind of tie us together. One of those common historical events is something that was very big. It was August 15, 1969, when one of the greatest well-known festivals of music history was created. It was during the time of the Vietnam War. The Lyndon B. Johnson administration was going on. There was all the rage and a counterculture movement that was just incredible. But this was three days of peace. That's right, three days of a music festival that was created in the minds of one man. And that is our guest today joining us on the Beyond 50 radio program today, Michael Lang, and the book is The Road to Woodstock, from the man behind the legendary festival. And I'd like to welcome Michael Lang to the Beyond 50 radio program. How are you doing today, Michael? I'm doing great. Nice to be here. You bet. Now, it's. I, I hope that you got your uh, rain insurance this time. <laughs> <laughs> now, it's interesting as you start out in the book to find out what your roots were, you know, growing up in, in New York, uh, mostly in the Jewish community, and then here you were kind of getting into the counterculture movement and eventually moving down to Coconut Grove, Florida, where you opened up your first head shop where people were having a real hard time with the idea of marijuana use. But then all of a sudden, as you were kind of fighting against that, you were also bringing in talent as well. So it seemed like putting together music festivals was something that you were destined to do. It, you know, it, it was interesting how many different factors came together and, and gave me a background that enabled me to figure out how to do this thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You know, and we, of course, had tons of help. Now, let's talk about, uh, it seems like your very first festival was the one that you uh, produced in Florida, where Jimi Hendrix uh, apparently arrived by helicopter. Uh, Talk about the things that come together to put together a festival, and then to the point where you have the vision of putting together something to the level of a Woodstock concert. Well, putting together an event in 1968 was interesting because there was very little precedent for even the kind of thing we were doing. There was Monterey, and there were probably a couple of other things, Newport. Um, But we decided to go into a fixed facility, which was Gulfstream Park in Miami. Uh, We had very little time to put it all together, I think five weeks or so. Um, So building up, you know, sort of an outdoor park um, was not really part of anything that would be possible. So in a way, uh, this simplified things. We used flatbed trailers for the stages. Uh, We parked, you know, two-by-twos and had three sets of stages so we could rotate the acts and just really kind of figured out what made practical sense. Uh, the booking was, was also last minute. I went up to New York and uh, met a guy named Hector Morales who uh, was at William Morris Agency and thought I was crazy but was willing to help. And so we just, you know, picked talent that we thought would be, you know, interesting that people would like and that we liked um, and put the money together amongst a bunch of friends and, and uh picked a name and went. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I know there was an interesting uh, story that in and within that uh, the, the Miami Pop Festival that we're talking <laughs> about here where apparently the brake security came in and somebody was demanding their money before they left. And you were yeah, like, actually, well, it stays yeah. right here. Exactly. Talk, about, talk a little bit about the behind-the-scenes stuff with that and some of the craziness that goes on. Well, I mean, there's, a, there's lots of, of, of intrigue. What, what happened was on the first day, um, this was in May of 68, the weather was beautiful. The place was packed. We were, you know, it was just the most amazing, you know, event I'd ever been part of. And people seemed to be completely taken with it. The music was great, as I said. And, and uh, it was very eclectic. And, and we thought, God, this was easy. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, you know, everything's working so beautifully. And, and then, of course, the next morning, torrential rain started uh, pouring and didn't stop. And it turned out they had seeded the clouds over the Everglades because... We had been in, in the midst of a drought, uh, and that was really my first experience with not taking rain insurance. Uh, <laughs> Thought I'd come up with a joke at the beginning of the show. Now. Yeah, really. <laughs> <laughs> but in any case, you know, the head of our security, the guys who were, you know, taking tickets and keeping order, um, saw that it was raining and realized that we might be in financial trouble and insisted on taking money out, their money, immediately <laughs> from whatever was in the box office. And a Brinks... Uh, guard had arrived to take the money to the bank to be distributed later and he was very serious about his job and there was this sort of almost this gunfight at the okay corral right here in the middle of the office uh luckily we were able to chill it out and and uh nobody got hurt but it was a very dramatic moment especially for me it was sort of my first time in anything like that 
Now, was that the point that you said to yourself that this is something I believe that I want to continue to do, which is to produce the large music events that you eventually found yourself doing? Not really. I, you know, it was not a career path or or, or any kind of a of a pursuit. I, you know, it was sort of a one-off thing for me. I, I enjoyed it. We tried to do a few concerts after that. Um, a guy named Rico Feldman and myself were partners and uh, thought we'd be able to recoup some of our money to, by doing, I think we... We brought Ravi Shankar down and a couple of other acts, and of course, for the rest of that month, it continued to rain out every one of our shows. <laughs> <laughs> That's no good, but, if that, no. but that wasn't something that stopped the Woodstock uh, concert no. from happening. I mean, people just huddled up, came together, and you know, it's funny because as I even would talk to my kids today, and you know, the younger generations, when we have these outdoor festivals, I said, you know, I was going to festivals at a time when you could still bring in your ice cooler. You could pretty much bring in anything you wanted to. And now, you know, you've got security to such a level that they're basically, you know, x-raying you as you go into the place. And and it's really kind of sad that festivals have turned to that direction where you have to be so secure versus an event such as Woodstock. Now, let's talk about what you envisioned as you put Woodstock together. And I also understand that it originally wasn't slated for the place that it actually turned out. No, that's true. And really, the vision for Woodstock came from from uh, lots of different directions. I had moved to, to Woodstock, New York, after uh, that summer in Miami, or that season in Miami, I should say, um, and had started going to some of the concert, local concerts called Sound Outs, which were um, on a farm just outside of town, very low-key, very bucolic setting. And I thought, you know, this is an amazing way to hear music and, and uh, to bring people out into the country and away from, you know, sort of the, their normal day-to-day lives was, to me, really a, an inspiration. So I met Artie Cornfield shortly thereafter, and between the two of us talking about the Miami Pop Festival and, and this idea of doing a bigger concert series like the Sound Outs, Woodstock sort of emerged as our idea of a gathering of all of the... The, the kids in the in the counterculture who sort of believed in in kind of the, the way that we did it. Um, that that whole decade, um, the '60s and into the '70s, really was were were very tumultuous times and, and very interesting times to be young and feeling empowered. Mm-hmm. Um, and we were about stopping the war and and uh, human rights issues and and you know, healthier ways of eating and treating the planet and all those sort of sustainability issues started to grow out of that era. And so we thought, let's bring all this together in a big exposition and see, you know, if we can actually pull this off when we were in charge. And and that's what we attempted to do. Mm-hmm. Now, there were also some really, you know, you bring up Artie Cornfield. There was also people such as Abby Hoffman who were behind the scenes. We've got Mess Pomeroy. I mean, we just have a whole clue. And what's really interesting about how this book here, uh, The Road to Woodstock, is put together as that you have nice quotes and paragraphs of what people were experiencing, you know, such as John Sebastian just talking about the beauty of what he's seeing unfold in front of him, you know, and how mm-hmm. the connection of people taking care and watching out for each other, for instance, yeah. at it this was, place, you know, at such a large group, you're looking at more than 300,000 people all living together for three days. It became just an amazing community of very positive thinking people uh, who realized that we were all sort of at the end of the day, brothers and sisters, and we were here to help each other and live live in kind of a better way with each other. Mm-hmm. It was a very hopeful event. It was, you know, and it was at a time when things were not so hopeful. We were in in the midst of the Vietnam War, and lots of political groups were getting violent to make their points, and and we'd gone through several assassinations of, you know, Robert Kennedy and um, Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, and and soon after that, the Manson murder. So it was a, it was a pretty dire time. Mm-hmm. And Woodstock was sort of like a beacon of hope in all of that. Mm-hmm. Well, it certainly had that. You could just see that people were really enjoying not only the event itself and, and the largeness of it, but again, as I was saying earlier, they just seemed to really connect with each other, take care of each other. And, uh, you know, and there was a lot of people behind the scenes when you consider this event, too, you know, putting together the countless volunteers that you had to bring together, you know, your your peace tribe, as you would call it, just just so many elements to doing something like that. You almost think that it was almost like the last great event of its kind, as it's been said, because it was sort of like the last peaceful event versus, you know, the second Woodstock, for instance, in the early 90s. Well, the second one actually was pretty peaceful too, and that worked that worked really well. The, the end of Woodstock '99 
Got a little hairy. <laughs> okay, okay. I guess I got those two confused yeah. then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now let's talk about uh, some of the acts. I mean, this is the first time that Carlos Santana basically came out on stage. Uh, Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young, they were pretty much unknowns. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about how you came to line these people up. Did they just come up to you and say, you know, this sounds like something we'd like to be a part of? Well, it wasn't that casual. <clears throat> I, I heard a press, test pressing of the Crosby, Stills, and Nash album uh, it, at uh, my friend Hector's office. David Geffen was managing them and brought it in one day and said, you got to hear this. And I did, and I booked them on the spot. And um, a local band in San Francisco, they hadn't recorded yet, but Bill Graham sent me their tape. And they just knocked me out, and I thought, you know, this would be a great thing to, to show, you know, to expose to people for the first time. Mm-hmm. And how did you go about finding the person that would actually film the whole thing? Uh, that was a very last-minute thing. We tried to sell the film to every major studio for months, and, and uh, the problem was that Monterey had come out, and Monterey, I thought, was an amazing movie and an amazing event, <clears throat> and nobody was interested. It didn't do any business at the box office. So when we came with you know this idea to have Woodstock filmed, everybody was sort of saying, we've been there and we've done that, and it didn't work. So nobody was really interested in um at some point, Michael Wadley, I think about a week before the actual festival, had come up because he was looking for a music event to film to try out some new techniques and and sort of fell in love with what we were doing. And in the meantime, Artie had been having conversations with Warner Brothers, uh, specifically with with Freddie Weintraub, who was their kind of uh, youth, um, token youth guy, I guess. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um someone who could bring them into sort of what was happening with, with young people in those days. And and um, through Freddie, he made a last-minute deal, I think, on Thursday of the, of the week of the festival. We were going to shoot it anyway, whether, we, whether we'd had that deal or not, but it turned out to be advantageous because they helped get film in. And we were, as I recall, every helicopter that came in, in, in addition to whatever else they were carrying, were carrying rolls of, of uh, raw stock for the cameras. Now, Richie Havens was the first one to take the stage. How were things before he went on as far as how you were feeling, how everybody was feeling, with several hundred thousand people out there anticipating this thing to get kicked off? Um, You know, we were worried because traffic was so intense that things weren't getting through the roads. And, you know, we we could fly the bands and we'd hire just about every helicopter in that part of the state, but... Um, we couldn't fly the equipment in, and so a lot of things were stuck on the road, and we were worried about things getting too late. So I just started looking around for who was there and, and who I could put on, who was, you know, the least equipment and and the easiest to to, uh, to get started with. And I first settled on Tim Harden and uh, talked to Tim for a while, and he was he was just coming off of a heroin uh, addiction and was. Um, nervous and you know not 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 really feeling his own sort of confidence and just we couldn't do it basically so my next target was richie havens <laughs> i remember chasing him around for about an hour and a half before he agreed to go on <laughs> get up there or we're throwing you out <laughs> <laughs> but he I was great i mean he was actually the perfect opening act it was just he said you know such great things to, to the people and, and really sort of started the whole the whole event off with with the right spirit and the right mood. Mm -hmm. Because I know, I think it was just before that, there was a quote in here uh, from the book uh, by Artie Kornfeld. I said to them, if there's a riot and everybody dies, you'll have one of the biggest selling movies of all time. (laughs) (laughs) So even though maybe the Monterey Pop Festival didn't work well as far as a a theater gig, you know, this could have been something. And it turned out to be successful anyway. (laughs) Yeah. It was actually their biggest film of the year. (laughs) <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> now, what do you think were some of the highlights from your perspective of when when this event just went and got going? Because a lot of people, when they remember Woodstock, they'll remember Joe Cocker singing, you know, I get by with a little help from my friends, or Jimi Hendrix playing the Star Spangled Banner, or, you know, Santana just getting out there and electrifying the way that Santana did. But yeah. for, from your perspective, what do you think? Was it the whole thing, or were there elements you just said, man, it doesn't even get any more spiritual than this? Well, you know, the stars were the people, you know, and, and that that was through from from really, you know, the, the first day. Uh, you knew that, that this was a, really about the people who were coming and what they were making out of this. And, and so those moments kept coming, and, and 
it started really for us, you know, in, in the way we planned this. Um, I'd been to lots of shows that summer and tried to understand what, what caused the violence because there was, were lots of violent incidents at pretty much every show that summer. Um, and I wanted to have Woodstock, you know, sort of be a place where everyone was welcome and nobody, where there weren't these stupid confrontations. Mm-hmm. If you didn't have money, you could come in. If you couldn't afford to eat, you know, there was a free kitchen. Uh, you could you could hear the music and, and be a part of it. And so we brought in groups like the Hog Farm, who had helped people set up their campgrounds and, and helped them, you know, help feed them if they didn't have money and those kinds of issues came up. Uh, people on bad trips, they'd know how to deal with, with, with people who weren't used to taking drugs and who had taken them for the first time and, and when it, were having a, a, a bad experience. And and so we really tried to make sure that people were taken care of when they came in, in the right way. And, and we're given this idea that we're all here to help each other, you know, get through. And that spread from the first people that arrived to the to the next group and the next group and the next group and and that to me was the you know the real miracle of Woodstock was that everybody really felt that energy and bought into it in a very sincere way and and that's really why it worked. Yeah, I know when you talk about you know going over the different festivals to see you know what kinds of things triggered the violence so that those could be curved. You know, you're immediately thinking about you know, the Altamont Raceway concert with the Rolling Stones in which, you know, a very frustrated crowd was extremely frustrated with, you know, the Hells Angels just basically yeah. pushing them around. Yeah. You think, you know, that's the kind of nonsense that maybe started to perpetuate how security became more and more tighter, you know, over the time with outdoor festivals that are very unique in and of themselves. Did you have to deal with any of those kind of issues at all? Well, you know, we we wanted security there, but we wanted it to be a peace force, not um, right. Security for us, because we felt that you know, with a, we were planning on two hundred thousand people, not a half a million. But even with two hundred thousand people, you can't really control what they do. You can right. sort of create. <laughs> yeah. You can't. I mean, you know, you can bring an army in, I guess. But, but, but that's not the idea. The idea is to create a space where they can be their better selves, where people, you know, aren't hassled for no reason, where where they're allowed to express their real feelings about each other and about themselves and and how they want to you know relate to everyone and how they want to live and and so we felt that we could create that space people the rest would take care of itself so uh, the people that we had initially brought were off-duty New York City cops who you know spent time in East Village and were used to these kids and weren't freaked out by somebody smoking marijuana and they wouldn't be armed they would be there to help people and not to arrest them and and that was kind of the way the tone was set for the entire security system and and it was really we were securing ourselves you know as Wavy Gravy said to some reporter in the airport when when the hog farm arrived and they said you guys are here to do secure and he said do you feel secure and the guy said yeah i said well i guess it's working <laughs> <laughs> that's great now um when it comes to uh so, you know i was just thinking it was a couple of years ago that for the first time i found out about a festival that i didn't even know existed and that was the uh summer of love the concert at the isle of white uh-huh. and that was a huge event there but that was a tremendous amount of tension. So when you take yes. a look at something like that and what's proceeded after that, you realize Woodstock truly is like Studio 54. It's an unrepeatable event sort of in its own right. It's true. I mean, you know, there is a business aspect to everything. Somebody puts up money and expects mm-hmm. a return and and how you – value that part of, of your your endeavor is really what controls how well things can go or not. And and you know, if that's your only motive then then you're you're much more focused on that than you know, how good a time people are gonna have. Yeah. You can tell by the frustration of the promoters for the one at the Isle of Wight. Yeah. He started cussing at everybody you got <laughs> what is know. it, six hundred plus thousand people, seventy thousand have paid and you're focused on the others that didn't, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you were probably glad you weren't part of that one. <laughs> yes, I was. <laughs> <laughs> now, I've got uh, the question on the album cover of, of Woodstock. There's yep. that couple. Have you yes. talked with those uh, people at all since then? Or? I have. In fact, you know, we did a documentary uh, I produced for BH1 and the History Channel that Barbara Koppel directed, um, and that couple was part of the film. And they were really fascinating, you know, to follow them, you know, their story. They told the story of how they met there. and. Um, and you don't find out until the end of the piece that that those were the people on the album cover. But but uh, you know there there were so many stories. I mean, so many people have approached me with their Woodstock stories and 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 sort of what it meant to them then and how life changing it was and and you know how it sort of set them on a different path. That that I always find that really uh, fulfilling. 
For those of you just tuning in, you're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. Our guest today, Michael Lang. He was the man behind the scene of the legendary festival simply known as Woodstock. And the book is The Road to Woodstock. Now, do you have anything, uh, any kind of uh, planning for a festival coming up uh, in the near future? No, we don't. We're working on a piece for Broadway, actually, a musical, oh, okay. sort of based around that whole sort of era and, and those times. So you really don't have to worry about rain insurance then? Not for, not this time. <laughs> <laughs> well, Michael Lang, is there a website people can go and find out more about what you're up to? And uh... um, Well, there's Woodstock.com, which I invite everybody to, to come and take a look look at and become a part of, really. I mean, that's it's, it's for us, and that's why we, mm-hmm. we, we started it, and hopefully that will uh, grow into a big community site for all of us. Well, very good. Well, Michael Lang, thank you. It's been a pleasure to have you on the program today. My pleasure. You bet. And again, the book is The Road to Woodstock from the man behind the legendary festival, our guest, Michael Lang. We want to thank you for tuning in. You've been listening to the Beyond 50 Radio program. Be sure to also visit us at our website at beyond50radio.com and sign up for our free weekly e-newsletter. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for tuning in. And remember, live your day past half. Thank you.